Thunder on the Right by Alan Crawford, Chapter 4 Read by Fax Fivem Opening with this quote What is power? It is the ability to tell others what the issues are, what the issues mean, and identify who the good guys and bad guys are. That is power. The quote is attributed to Howard Phillips of the Conservative Caucus. Chapter 4 is aptly titled, Good Guys and Bad Guys. Some weeks before the New Hampshire presidential primary of 1976, New Right fundraiser Richard A. Vigiri and a handful of key advisors flew to Texas to meet with former Texas Governor John B. Connolly. Gerald Ford was in the White House, but barely, and Ronald Reagan, the overwhelming favorite of the conservatives, had made known his intention to challenge the incumbent for the nomination. Reagan, with support of William Loeb's Manchester Union leader, could be strong in the Granite State and possibly finish off Ford then and there. The purpose of the call on Connolly, however, was to forestall the Reagan campaign by persuading the Texas political leader, once a Democrat, to enter the New Hampshire primary too, as a Republican. When Connolly turned down the offer, the Vigiri faction scattered around for other options, an effort by the new right to knock Ford and Reagan out of the race may sound bizarre, but it is wholly consistent with the rationale. The new right divides people into good guys and bad guys. It has a hero complex and a villain complex. Yesterday's good guy may become today's bad guy. The new right imposes severe standards and thus is often disillusioned. Failure to live up to these severe standards is considered betrayal and meets with hostility bordering on hatred. The new rightists have been enthusiastic in turn about Barry Goldwater, George Wallace, Ronald Reagan, and John Connolly. Despite early enthusiasm for Connolly, who courted new right leaders, the new right nevertheless showed early signs of disillusion, abandoning yet another hero. There is a logic in what looks like madness. The logic is an obsession with political style, a militant againism over any coherent political program or philosophy, a hardline intolerance of political compromise, tempered only by the cynicism of some self-serving new right leaders. These new rightists, it seems clear, will forgive or overlook deep flaws in their political leaders if their style is sufficiently bellicose, or if such forgiveness or selective vision serves the opportunists' immediate ends. The new right good guys are aggressive and tough customers eager to do battle with what they see as the corrupt forces of liberalism and liberalism's agents. The new right ideologues, as opposed to the new right opportunists, refuse to compromise and therefore they reject the dynamics and art of politics itself. The good guys are those individuals who are untainted by liberalism or moderation, they oppose it to the last corral, shooting it like some Wild West sheriff holding off the outlaws of liberalism, like Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts. The most dangerous man who can do this country great damage. According to the Reverend Jerry Falwell of Moral Majority, the ideal of the new right, as noted, is the lonesome lawman sitting tall in the saddle, one brave man against a corrupt and lawless Old West. The new rightists show their greatest contempt not for liberals, but for individuals who are reluctant to ride the plains alone, who have adjusted to national politics. It is the old range war all over again, independent cattle ranchers against the settled farmers. Good guys turned bad guys. Convinced that the political system is corrupt, the new rightists distrust and resent those who have chosen to work within it, since those who do must, of necessity, make deals, negotiate. Compromise means cooperation with the liberal outlaws and a loss of integrity. By this logic, those who succeed in the political world and attain real influence are corrupt and can no longer be trusted to advance the true cause. Only the loners who refuse to play by the game of the system are to be trusted. Consequently, any right-of-center politician or spokesman who achieves truly national stature is automatically suspect. Such a catch-22 situation is well described by M. Stanton Evans in an adage about right-wing politicians. He firmly believes, 
By the time they get into a position where they can help us, they are no longer one of us. Ironically, self-described liberals are often treated with less hostility than our conservative Republicans who stain their reputations by compromising with liberals, not unlike the communists' traditional hatred of socialists and liberals. The new right sees such compromise as soft or squishy, the equivalent in the vernacular of the Old West of being yellow-bellied. In 1962, Future new right leaders like William Rusher and Lee Edwards were active in the draft Goldwater movement, which succeeded in nominating the Arizona senator for president in 1964. Both, by 1976, had turned against their former mentor because he endorsed the moderate to conservative Gerald Ford and thus weakened Ronald Reagan's challenge for the GOP nomination. Yet by that same year, Edwards, the author of the 1968 campaign biography, Reagan, a political biography, had decided that Reagan himself was too establishment and, as he told me, now preferred George Wallace as president. In fact, Reagan's challenge to incumbent President Ford provided the pretext for the political mugging of Barry Goldwater, once a symbol of courage and conviction, the man who offered a choice, not an echo to American right-wingers. The statue was knocked off its pedestal, beginning with a fascinating attack by Vigerian Edwards in Conservative Digest in 1975, lamenting the fact that the news media and millions of Americans are still looking to Senator Goldwater to point the way conservatives will go. Vigiri wrote in his magazine, We can't afford to expect more of any man than he is able to give. We must separate reality from myth. Fact from fiction, if we have reached the point where a new generation of conservative leaders is needed, and I believe we have, it's important for the rank and file of U.S. conservatism to know that Goldwater had come to represent a serious problem for conservatives, Edward and Vigiri wrote. His image continues to be used and misused by others in and out of the media. The National Press Corps use Goldwater's still unique reputation for their own uses, quoting him when it suits their purposes. When Goldwater urged President Nixon to come clean on Watergate in 1973, the Conservative Digest's publisher was dismayed that the news media gave his remarks front-page play. When he urged that Reagan reassess his decision to seek the Republican nomination, Goldwater's enormous prestige was used by the media in an obvious effort to undercut Reagan. The so-called liberal captivity of the Republican Party was blamed on Goldwater's reluctance in 1975 to support the so-called conservative candidate, Dean Birch of California, for the GOP chairmanship. As a result, conservatives lost control of the Republican National Committee and the Republican Party. The Goldwater, whom the right had come to know and love for his presidential bid in 1964, simply was no more, and perhaps had never been. The real Goldwater never wanted to be president, and does not want to be a national leader today. Rather, he is a man who will stay in his office operating his shortwave radio while there is a roll call vote on the floor. If the issue before the Senate is busing, gun control, or some similar domestic issue, Goldwater will almost invariably be gone if a vote comes at supper time. Goldwater is becoming increasingly lazy, content to vote conservative, but not to lead any conservative opposition or counterattack. The object of the assault was twofold. First, those in the conservative digest circle, Vigiri, Paul Wyrick, Howard Phillips, and the other new rightists, wanted to undercut whatever allegiance Goldwater may still have commanded from conservative voters, lest those voters support Ford over a challenge from the right. Second, the new right sought to assert its own leadership as the new generation of right-wing leaders. The audience for the article was as much the national news media as conservatives in the hinterlands. The objective was to establish, if only by implication, that the new rightists and not Goldwater Republicans were the new spokesmen for true conservatives. When Goldwater began to campaign for Ford in 1976 and criticized Reagan, others on the right joined in the anti-Goldwater chorus. In his syndicated column, William Rusher expressed amazement that Goldwater had found good things to say about his old rival Nelson Rockefeller, speculating...
that Goldwater's grip on conservative principles just isn't, and perhaps never was, the absolutely dependable thing we believed it to be. A month later, David Brudnoy, a conservative libertarian commentator from Boston, followed up with a column of his own titled The Trouble with Barry. Noting Goldwater's support for Ford, Brudnoy accused Goldwater of putting expediency before principle. Concluding that Whatever happens to Ford and Reagan, Barry Goldwater is through as Mr. Conservative. The Conservatives never retrieve their wounded, and to Conservative eyes in the image of Barry, Barry Burning Bright has become a mirage, a figment of past imagination. Even young Americans for freedom cast aside their characteristic deference and timidity towards their elders, issuing a press release that pronounced Goldwater's intemperate remarks about Reagan disappointing. Senator Goldwater's unfair and insensitive statement that Reagan's position reflect a surprisingly dangerous state of mind indicate to young conservatives that Goldwater has either abandoned the conservative philosophy for which he is known, or the sportsmanship and sense of fair play that have endeared him to millions. Moreover, the organization's monthly magazine, New Guard, concluded... As much as it hurts to admit it, the facts about Barry Goldwater are clear. Whatever his motivations, he has let conservatives down, and he leaves young conservatives no alternative but to look elsewhere for leadership, inspiration, and guidance. There's a footnote here that says the following. The current author's own role in this fiasco should not go unremarked. I was then editor of New Guard and wrote both the press release and the New Guard article. All in all, reaction to the mugging was favorable. Rusher, in a lengthy and published letter to Vigiri and Edwards, praised their thoughtful and courageous article, predicting that Goldwater would officially endorse Ford over Reagan. And that would be a great tragedy, not only for the Republican Party, but for the cause of conservatism and the future of America. William Loeb of the Manchester Union Leader in another published letter wrote to say that he was delighted with the article, especially given the kind and polite way the infidel Goldwater had been savaged. Kevin Phillips in his column noted, After all, Reagan is running against the Washington buddy system and Goldwater is part of it, a man quite comfortable with the mixture of top administration officials, cronies, and business lobbyists summed up in capital parlance, as the Burning Tree Country Club set. He said, Goldwater has been a lazy failure as a leader for at least six years, and the right will not allow him to pretend to national leadership ever again. Letters began to arrive at Conservative Digest's offices backing the publisher. One reader from Waverly, Ohio, lamented that Goldwater simply has lost his backbone, and all the vinegar has simply gone away. A Wilton, California reader wrote, I have been aware for over two years that Goldwater was turning soft. Several months before, one Conservative Digest reader wrote to protest the appearance of Goldwater's name in a poll of favorite conservatives. In checking your list of favorite conservatives, he wrote, I feel that Barry Goldwater should be removed from the list. At one time he was a conservative. He is favoring Rockefeller, and in other things, leans towards the liberal side. In July, columnist John Lofton wrote, I have read Senator Barry Goldwater's endorsement of President Ford, and not knowing precisely what motivated the senator, I am inclined to give Mr. Goldwater the benefit of the doubt on this one. It is obvious that Senator Goldwater's letter to all GOP convention delegates was written at a time when he was, well, not himself. Perhaps during the post-operative period for a hip condition, when he was either still in an ether fog, possessed of all his faculties, he would never say things like he is saying about Reagan. Oddly enough, the new rightists were already in the process of deciding that Reagan as the GOP nominee or as president would be worse than Ford.
As early as 1975, conservative columnist James J. Kilpatrick had issued a warning about the right's absolutism. Reagan's difficult task is to project an image of moderate conservatism. The very notion will outrage rack-ribbed 100 percenters who now cheer his every word. To them, moderation is a seldom a virtue, extremism rarely a vice. If Reagan ever appears to be waffling toward the left, they will turn on him with cries of Judas. But Reagan will never make it to the White House if he is perceived, as Goldwater was perceived, as a monster who would abandon the old folks and atomize little girls. One conservative activist, then becoming disenchanted with the activities of the new rightists, told me of a Kingston meeting at which Wyrick of the Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress surveyed the other participants, many of them still Reagan loyalists, and announced, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not for Reagan. If he gets in, we're out. We'd have no input in that administration. Reagan's decision to retain the fundraising services of Bruce W. Eberle and Associates instead of those of Vigiri reportedly disappointed many new rightists and angered Vigiri, thus increasing tensions between the new rightists and the Reagan camp, which was viewed as dominated by Republican Party professionals and not right-wing ideologues. These tensions exploded at the 1976 Republican convention after Reagan selected as his vice presidential running mate Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania, a man with a liberal voting record. Vigiri and his friends announced plans to attend the American Independent Party convention coming up in Chicago, and Illinois Congressman Philip Crane was especially angered since he expected Reagan to name him and not his next-door neighbor in McLean, Virginia. William F. Buckley, who had remained aloof from the internecine warfare at the GOP convention, observed in his newspaper column that perhaps the explosion over Schweiker was premature, that he was, in fact, a perfectly acceptable choice upon which a new majority coalition could be built. Schweiker, after all, enjoyed a strong support from labor unions and had consistently voted with the right on the social issues such as busing, gun control, abortion, and the death penalty. What is more, he was skeptical about the Helsinki Human Rights Accord and generally opposed detente with the Soviet Union. As David Keene, a Reagan aide instrumental in the Schweiker gambit, told me, They didn't understand this because they are not sophisticated enough to see that far into it. These are not, you must understand, the most well-reflective people. Another American conservative union activist told me the Schweiker explosion pointed up yet another serious problem with the new right. They don't know their own program. They talk a great deal about compromise to attract support from those who do not ordinarily identify themselves as conservatives. But they denounce the slightest variation from long-held right-wing dogma. Many Reagan supporters had become convinced that Reagan's national campaign was infiltrated by liberals. <laughs> Chief among them, Reagan's campaign manager, John Sears III, who worked for Nixon in 68 and Reagan in 76. It was Sears, after all, who orchestrated the Schweiker move, and Reagan's political action committee, Citizens for the Republic, reluctant to anger party regulars, had refused in 78 to contribute to conservative Republicans who were challenging GOP incumbents. Sears, for his part, was convinced that his candidate's most serious liability was the public's perception of him, as a right-wing ideologue. Events may erase that impression. Sears said announcing in 1979 that Reagan was seriously considering dropping his long-held opposition to full diplomatic ties to communist China. Reagan promptly denied it, but the damage had been done. Before Reagan's denial, the New York Times reported that the move gave the impression that Reagan was ready to embrace a more flexible attitude toward international communism. By February of 1980, Reagan replaced Sears to the great jubilation of supporters, conservative and new right. Reagan did seem to be softening his reputation as a crypto-social Darwinist. I know I'm supposed to be a terrible right-wing person, the Wall Street Journal quoted him as saying early in 1978 to a group of Chicago businessmen. But I just wish people who think that would look at my record in California. There he boasted he had initiated 
conjugal visits in state prisons made the income tax more progressive and increased welfare benefits to the truly needy. Such breathtaking reversals as seen by the new right caused a number of rightists to conclude that, however genuine his commitment to conservative principles, Reagan is through as an inter-party ideologue. They began to take aim at him in 1978, as they had earlier in 75 against Goldwater. Kevin Phillips wrote in his syndicated column that in addition to marking the transformation of citizens for the republic into a vehicle of the party, not principle, the behavior of the Reagan camp might well personify the Californians' effective retirement from relevant political struggles. Gone is the would-be charismatic insurgent of several years ago, the crusader who called for a politics of bold ideological colors, not pale pastels. Now we have in his place a 67-year-old party regular preaching unity while aides hint that he'd serve only one term, leaving the Republican ideological factional future up for grabs. Advisors who encourage Reagan to shed his ideology may be, be misreading the intensity of his strength on the right, though among the right-wing activists a considerable number see Reagan as an aging figure from another era, an easygoing man who could easily be ineffective or worse as president. To the extent that he retains his ideological vim and credibility, Reagan diffuses those private critics. But to the extent that he becomes just another faithful Republican, he gives doubters the reinforcement they require. Die-hard rightists might indeed be disappointed with a Reagan presidency, or very likely by any presidency, although they long to achieve that pinnacle. Reagan's record is an illustration of the seeming inability of any mainstream politician, once in office, to live up to the expectations of the new right. When Reagan first ran for governor in California, he promised a quarter billion dollar cut in his first year budget, but the budget increased from 4.6 billion to 5.7 billion, and by the time he left office eight years later had swelled to 10.2 billion. The average yearly increase for the state budget was 12.2%. The state sales tax rose from 4 to 6 percent, corporate income taxes from 5.5 to 9 percent, and top personal income taxes from 7 to 11 percent. The number of state employees increased by 5.7 percent, while the total number of federal civilian employees during that period declined by more than 3 percent. Though Reagan had been critical of public spending for education, state funding for public elementary and high schools under his administration rose 105 percent while enrollment increased only by 5%, and state support for junior colleges soared 323%. Grants and loans to college students, highly criticized by conservatives as well as new rightists as scandal-ridden federal programs, shot up 900%. Despite attacks on government interference, Reagan sponsored what has been described as one of the toughest water pollution control laws in the U.S., and stepped up state control over auto repair, home insurance, real estate, retail business, doctors, and dentists. He increased inheritance taxes, provided tax credits for renters, reduced the oil depletion allowance, and stiffened the capital gains tax. A frequent critic of gun control, Reagan signed into law the Mulford Act, which provided a penalty of one year's imprisonment or a thousand dollar fine for anyone found with a loaded gun in his possession on a public highway, unless he could prove that he was in immediate danger. Despite a reputation as a hardliner on foreign policy, Reagan strongly implied that even in the event of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe, he could not conceive of using nuclear weapons, a statement for which he was taken to task in 1976, even by the liberal New Republic. While conservative writers and human events relentlessly attacked the liberal drifter of the Nixon years, Reagan, true to his accommodating, genial nature, was silent even on detente and wage and price controls. A Nixon loyalist, Reagan actually defended the second story men of the committee to re-elect the president when they were caught burglarizing the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate. They were well-meaning individuals, Reagan said, who were not criminals at heart. Many disgruntled Reagan supporters, in fact, believed he could have easily defeated Ford for the nomination had he only gone on the attack, casting aside the 11th commandment. Thou shalt speak no ill of another Republican. Which made his early primary challenges to Ford in 75 seem half-hearted and unnecessary. Would the soft-spoken Reagan compromise with liberals? 
He talked about the California State Legislature in the harshest terms. Wrote newspaper Enterprise Association columnist Ray Cromley. I personally negotiated privately at greater length with legislative leaders than any previous governor. He introduced more compromise bills and legislative compromises on major as well as minor points, perhaps more than any other California executive within my memory. Did he have the commitment, the stomach, to wage the political warfare the new right believes is necessary? Probably not. A governor who worked from nine to five, he delegated authority, interested only in broad policy decisions. He left the details to others. A framed photograph of Reagan in cowboy clothes at his ranch hangs on the wall of former aide Lynn Nofziger's office. Lynn. It is inscribed. Why can't I be like this more often? Though he starred in numerous Western movies, Reagan never was cast in the role of the tough, lonely sheriff, which did not fit his image. He was the nice guy, the amiable and easygoing fellow who did not like to spook the herd, an image that followed him through most of his films. He is in fact a more moderate politician than even his most ardent admirers would like to believe. He is, in short, a politician. To the extent that his rightist followers have made him out to be something other than he is, he cannot be held responsible for the sense of betrayal when he acts according to what he is, not what they think he is or should be. He could be more, but not less, likely to disappoint those with unrealistic expectations of the office and the man than any one else the rightists might choose to follow. Good guys who are still good guys. The new right has embraced almost uncritically such rhetorically belligerent symbols of bipartisan reaction as George Wallace. Former New Hampshire Governor Meldrum Thompson, North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms, and Georgia Congressman Larry McDonald. These choices display no significant strain of political or philosophical conservatism. They have been singled out by the new right for reasons other than political or philosophical consistency, for political style, a state of redneck reaction. Wallace, perhaps more than any other contemporary political figure, represents to the new right those cherished qualities found in the mythic Old West Sheriff come to town to do battle with the liberal outlaws, tough, brave, and willing to take on all comers, these leaders, Wallace, Thompson, Helms, McDonald, Republicans, and Democrats, symbolize to new rightists the qualities necessary to rout the effet Eastern liberals and... Turn this country around. The new rightists looked with favor also on debonair Illinois Congressman Philip Crane, but he is of a different mold. Neither primitive nor raging, he's not a redneck reactionary. Their support for him confounded their preferred style, and it proved to be a passing fancy. They also turned, with some reservations, to a new style lawman, Big John Connolly, who combines the vigor of the Old West with the slick aplomb of a riverboat gambler. He has inherited the sheriff's star they once awarded to George Wallace. Wallace is a good guy who has survived new right disillusionment, in large part since being shot in 1972. He is a figure from the past, viewed with a certain nostalgia. Traditional conservatives, of course, disassociated themselves from Wallace. National Review dismissed the former Alabama governor as an undesirable, flagitious demagogue who, when in office, combined a skillful appeal to populist emotions with egregious welfare statism. James J. Kilpatrick, in Conservative Digest, stated categorically that Wallace is no conservative, but a political Bobby Riggs, a hustler, showman, master of the trick shot. New right activists eager to forge a new majority alliance between right-wing Democrats and disaffected GOP Reaganites, possibly under the banner of a new political party, talked throughout 1975 and 76 of Wallace, almost to the exclusion of Reagan, even before Reagan made plain his decision to stay with the GOP. Pat Buchanan wrote approvingly in his book, Conservative Votes, Liberal Victories, of a Wallace-Reagan third-party ticket, and William Rusher in his own book, The Making of the New Majority Party, considered Wallace crucial to any alliance with blue-collar Democrats. Kevin Phillips proposed a Reagan-Wallace right deal for America in a guest column for Newsweek. Some compromise would be in order. All seemed to concede if the Wallace constituency were to be corralled, a compromise that would have to originate in the Reagan camp. 
Much would have to be overlooked or simply left unaddressed if the new right was to throw their support to Wallace. As Alabama governor from 62 to 66 and from 70 to 76, he was a fairly orthodox New Deal Democrat who expanded the size and scope of state government. The payroll in Alabama increased more than 100%, double the rate of growth for the federal bureaucracy during the same period. The number of civilian government employees added to state payrolls increased 113.3% during the Wallace years, compared to 17% on the federal level. The state budget went up twice as fast as the federal budget, 356.9% compared to 176.7%, while the federal debt increased 63% compared to almost 400% increase of the state debt under Governor Wallace. A legislative report card issued by the Alabama Chamber of Commerce during the years in which Wallace was a state legislator granted him a radical, and today a state administrator recalls Wallace then as... The leading liberal in the legislature, no doubt about that. He was regarded as a dangerous left-winger. A lot of people even looked on him as downright pink. One political crony, quoted by Marshall Frady in his book Wallace, 1968, said, His economic program surpassed the fondest dreams of every liberal in the state. In National Review in 1968, Ohio Congressman John Ashbrook, then National Chairman of the American Conservative Union, expressed surprise that many people consider Wallace a fiscal conservative, for his record shows that he is a big spender of other people's money. In 1952 and 56, Wallace supported Adlai Stevenson at the Democratic National Conventions, and in 1956, he delivered one of the seconding speeches for John Kennedy for vice president. Four years later, he supported Kennedy for president. New rightists nevertheless hailed George Wallace in 1976 as the savior of the conservative cause in part because of his shift from racial moderation to segregation. American conservatives should make no mistake with it, Ashbrook wrote in National Review. The only thing Wallace has against Washington is its racial policy. In all his other attitudes, he is one of the biggest centralizers of them all. In one campaign, Wallace ran as a racial moderate, accusing his opponent of espousing the principles of the Klan. When he lost, he turned around and ran the next time in 62 as a segregationist. As a conservative, I don't stand for enforced segregation. I stand for freedom, and I think the Constitution does too. But George Wallace's slogan only recently was segregation forever. And whatever he says now, this has been the source of his appeal. In my view, this separates him decisively from the conservative position. Ashbrook was speaking for classical conservatism. Wallace's emphasis on the race issue was not his primary source of appeal to the new right, however. His appeal went beyond race into his overall againism. The phrase, an invention of author Kirkpatrick Sale, is vividly described in Power Shift 1975, Sale's book on the rise of the Sun Belt. Wallace plums to, rubs, and inflames the fears of those uneasy with the present and wistful for some imagined past. The uncertain few who see themselves as the little against the big the white against the black, the uneducated against the intellectual, the powerless against the powerful, the frightened against the secure, the looked down on against the lookers down. Racism is a part of it, though somewhat muted in recent days, but more potent still is a broad adversarianism. Being against, Wallace has no real policies, plans, or platforms, and no one expects them of him. It is sufficient that he is again and gathers unto him others who are again, again the blacks, the intellectuals, the bureaucrats, the students, the journalists, the liberals, the outsiders, the communists, the changers above all. Again the Yankee establishment, when he berates the pointy-headed professors, the filthy rich on Wall Street, the federal judges playing God, the briefcase toting bureaucrats, and the socialist beaten at crowd running the government. When he says we're sick and tired of the average citizen being taxed to death while those billionaires like the Rockefellers and the Fords and the Mellons go without paying taxes, and when he excoriates the two major parties for having moved away from the people and says there's not a dime's worth of difference in any of them, National Democrats or National Republicans, then George Wallace is sounding that chord that resonates so richly throughout the Southern Rim. The good guys of the new right represent in varying degrees this adversarianism or againism 
a character trait the new rightists themselves view as essential in their leaders. Buchanan, for example, praised Wallace as the authentic voice of the forgotten American, the angry white working man, north and south, heard raucously and continuously since 1964. Unlike those synthetic new populists created out of press clippings whose strongest precincts are the dormitories of the Ivy League, Wallace was the genuine article, the favorite son of the hard hats and the wool hats. In 1966, 68, and 72, Wallace's appeal broadened. He came to represent for millions of Americans something other than defense of a dying past. He stirred the embers of patriotism and nationalism in a country whose elite had marched into Vietnam and lacked the capacity to see it through. Had he not been cut down in the Laurel Shopping Center, George Wallace could have been the catalyst for a new alignment in American politics. Social protest and not governing is the real interest of the new rightists. Thus, the fact that Wallace's policies on centralization of government and public spending were not unlike those of the hated liberals was not primary. Deep down, rightists were convinced. He's one of us. New rightists, therefore, were genuinely shocked and angered when Wallace endorsed fellow Southerner and Democrat Jimmy Carter in 1976 after losing the Florida primary, rejecting suggestions by new right activists that he lead a third-party effort. Outraged, syndicated columnist John Lofton considered Wallace's endorsement of Carter a betrayal. It's very sad, sad to have to say that at the end of his national political career, when the real crunch came, George Wallace put party above principle. His political career over, Wallace has been elevated in the eyes of the new rightists to the somewhat unique status of elder statesman of redneck reaction. When he endorses the candidate of the Democratic Party every four years, as he no doubt will, new rightists will think nothing of it. Such endorsements are customary and, carrying little weight, can do little to hurt the new rightists. He is viewed with affection and nostalgia, but he does not figure in their future plans. Another favorite of the new right, Meldrum Thompson of New Hampshire, is also out of office, but the new right hopes that he can make a comeback. A political power in the Northeast, Thompson is, like all the other new right angry heroes, Wallace, Helms, and McDonald, a Southerner. He was born in Georgia. He attended law school in Georgia, and later transplanted to New England and ran for governor of the Granite State and lost as an American Party candidate. He then won as a Republican in 72. He was so suspicious of his political opponents that one of his first official acts was to change the state house locks. He sent one of his top aides to examine the confidential tax records of his political opponents, an act the state Supreme Court promptly ruled unconstitutional. Thompson denounced the ruling. He would continue to enforce the Constitution as he saw fit. And not as it is understood by others. Defeated in 1978, for re-election to an unprecedented third term as governor, Thompson promptly joined the National Council of the John Birch Society. His support is more eclectic than his last move would suggest. He has admirers in more respectable circles as well. Still, he is at the core a Wallace-type primitive. Consciously controversial, the governor comes close to being a populist on the right, Pat Buchanan has written. With the same flair for bizarre behavior that marked the fiery and famous populace of the left, Huey Long. When Governor Thompson, a dapper and garrulous extrovert with a toothy grin, showed up as a Reagan supporter at the 1976 Republican Convention in Kansas City, wary Reagan aides assigned a special agent to follow him everywhere to make sure he did not say anything troublesome with an earshot of reporters. The agent's codename, The Muzzle. Thompson, like other new right politicians, is obsessed by symbolic acts of social protest. One of his favorite rituals was the lowering of state flags to half-mast whenever he did not like actions taken in Washington, which was quite often. Flags were at mourning at the signing of the Panama Canal Treaties. When he ordered the state house flags flown at half-mast on Good Friday to memorialize the death of Christ, the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union protested while courts kept the flags going up and down like yo-yos, according to a Washington Post account. The Supreme Court eventually upheld a lower court ruling against the governor. When President Ford called for a program of amnesty for Vietnam draft evaders, Thompson declared anti-amnesty day. On United Nations Day, he revived an ageless right-wing slogan and announced, Get the U.S. out of the U.N. week. 
He threatened to cut off funds for the University of New Hampshire at the first sign of any gay liberation organization on campus and, when confronted by priests seeking his endorsement of their boycott of Gallo Wines, Thompson hied off to the local liquor store and, gathering reporters around him, purchased a jug. Thompson gained great support nationally from the new right for his tough treatment of protesters at the Seabrook nuclear power plant. Budget-conscious Republicans in the state stressed the cost of jailing and prosecuting the thousands of demonstrators, but the new right was delighted. He ordered early anti-nuclear power activists arrested for attempting to collect signatures on petitions in parking lots of state liquor stores in which he had placed pro-Seabrook petitions. He sought to bar state employees from criticizing his policy. He cracked down hard, as human events put it, on the militant environmentalists, ordering state police to make mass arrests. After suggesting that the New Hampshire National Guard be trained in the use of nuclear weapons, the governor asked the state legislature to fund a giant fallout shelter for himself and the state's top 100 officials. <laughs> the project's total cost $750,000. Oddly enough, it was the tax issue that brought down Thompson in 78. In the only state in the union without either an income tax or sales tax, Thompson had built his entire political career on promises not to raise taxes. New Hampshire had become the fastest growing state in one of the most economically depressed regions of the country. 250 new industries came into the state and existing industries added 60,000 jobs with a state unemployment rate of only 3%, half of that in the surrounding states. More than 100,000 refugees from Taxachusetts migrated across the border from 70 to 76, but Thompson was defeated by his rising electric bills. The Public Service Company of New Hampshire, Seabrook's principal developer, had won permission from the Public Utility Commission to add a construction surcharge to its bills. Democratic legislators blocked the surcharge and Thompson vetoed it. Holding a utility bill in one hand, the Democratic candidate Hugh Gallen would charge. It's the first time Mel Thompson imposed the tax on the average family in this state, and they're not going to forget it. A lesser issue suggesting that Thompson was not minding the store was his eagerness to travel around the world, often in association with right-wing groups and causes. As governor and as chairman of Conservative Caucus, Thompson toured Taiwan, South Africa, Israel, Panama, Germany, and Great Britain. In his concession speech in 1978, Thompson vowed to return to the fray, prompting speculation that he would run for the U.S. Senate or try for the State House again. He toyed with running as a Republican favorite son candidate in the nation's earliest presidential primary, a move that would be devastating to other conservative candidates. Human events had quoted Governor Walter Peterson saying, Thompson, like many new rightists, had come to the feverish conclusion that Congressman Philip Crane was weakened by his willingness to accept federal campaign funds. Thompson had made public his refusal to support Reagan as long as John Sears, who denied Thompson control of the New Hampshire Reagan campaign in 76, remained as Reagan's campaign manager. With Thompson no longer governor, Sears virtually ignored him. Having endorsed a third-party movement in America, Thompson said later in 1979, that he would seek the presidency on an independent Constitution Party ticket. An equally blatant new rightist from the South, as Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina, also said to have presidential ambitions, the first Republican to represent the Tar Heel State in the Senate in this century. He is a doctrinaire and hard right as anyone in Washington, but with a reputation as a genuinely decent person and dedicated, hard-working senator. He is loathed by the liberal press, singled out by the editors of the nation as ultra and arch reactionary the son of a former police chief of monroe north carolina helms first came to public attention as an outspoken radio editorialist like Connolly, he was originally a democrat joining the republican party in 1970 and elected to the senate as a republican two years later tall courtly and soft-spoken he takes delight in fighting lost causes and sacrificing all save election to matters of principle Admirers on the right call him a totally principled politician, but his liberal critics dub him Senator No. In 1977, he made much of the information that New York banks like Midland, Marine, and Chase Manhattan had investments in Panama, with the implication that 
the renegotiation of the Panama Canal treaties was somehow a bailout. He introduced a constitutional amendment that would have denied abortion even in cases which the mother's health is endangered. Helms's record is more flexible on certain matters close to home. In his denunciations of federal spending, he offered, according to the Wall Street Journal, a spirited defense of the Agriculture Department's tobacco loan program, a position clearly at odds with his principled commitment to free enterprise. However, he voted against an agricultural appropriations bill with $3 million provisions for a tobacco research program in his own state because the bill included funds for the food stamp program. In 1978, he ignored his reputation as one of the Senate's most vigorous opponents of irresponsible expenditure of other people's money and waged the most expensive campaign fundraising in history with almost half of the $6.7 million raised going to firms controlled by Vigiri. Helms's campaign attacks on labor unions were, at the least, misleading. His fundraising letters, for example, charged that union bosses were out to get him and that his opponent, State Insurance Commissioner John Ingram, had been endorsed by the North Carolina's largest and most powerful union, the AFL-CIO. The facts were not exactly as presented. North Carolina is one of the least unionized states in the country, and the AFL-CIO is weak and ineffectual there. The union's endorsement of Ingram was lukewarm. Ingram had been offered, but he returned a $5,000 contribution. From the AFL-CIO's Committee on Political Education, having vowed not to accept out-of-state money from what he considered special interests. Helms's campaign depended on a campaign bureaucracy the candidate would have condemned in Washington, staffed by 150 workers with a budget of $4,000 for bookkeeping alone. He outspent Ingram by 30 to 1, and when the campaign was over, appealed to major contributors one last time with the news that his re-election effort was still roughly $200,000 in debt. The favorite senator of the far-out white supremacy groups, Helms does not go out of his way for the votes of black citizens in North Carolina, and unlike South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, he refused to support the District of Columbia Voting Rights Amendment in 79. Like many new right leaders, he consented to a lengthy interview in the John Birch Society's Review of the News, and has been praised by American Opinion, one of whose frequent contributors described him as this man who stands perfectly for everything which the sons of the Bolsheviks in Moscow and their alleged antagonists in Wall Street are trying to destroy in America. He is a force within right-wing politics. As a former Democrat in a state where Democrats outnumber Republicans three to one, Helms is seen as a key figure in forging a new right alliance between Southern Democrats and GOP Reaganites. Under his leadership, the state Republican Party registration increased more than 20%. M. Stanton Evans believes Helms to be potentially the pivotal figure in our politics, equipped to speak effectively to what has been called the new majority in the American electorate. As a Southerner, Helms has a natural kinship for the conservative Democrats of the once solid South. In fact, Helms's Democratic supporters are so numerous that the North Carolina press has given them a special name, Jesse Kratz. A major figure in drafting the conservative platform at the 76 Republican convention, Helms was also instrumental along with Congressman Crane in convincing Senator James L. Buckley of New York to offer his name to the convention as a compromise candidate for president, a move interpreted by many knowledgeable Washington conservatives as an attempt to punish Reagan for naming Senator Schweiker of Pennsylvania as his running mate. Buckley backed out before the trouble could begin. Helms, apparently ambitious for higher office, allowed North Carolina backers to mail several letters to Republicans who were potential delegates to the 1980 Republican convention, asking them to support Helms for the vice presidential nomination. Helms, however, is known to be sympathetic to third party movements and might lead such an effort should his disaffections with the Republican Party, a party of discount Democrats, Helms has called it, become intense enough. A three-term congressman from Georgia, Larry McDonald is a special favorite of the new right bipartisans because he is a Democrat and active supporter of such organizations as the Conservative Caucus, the American Conservative Union, the Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, the American Security Council, Gun Owners of America, the National Rifle Association, and the Young Americans for Freedom. He is also a member of the National Council of the John Birch Society, an affiliation his office literature boasts of. Tall and broad-shouldered, McDonald appears fit for his war with the Democratic establishment. 
He has told me that because of his views that he is the victim of marked bias and discrimination within the Democratic Caucus. This, he said, is the price you pay for trying to reclaim your party. Both major parties, he said, are dominated by the same forces, internationalist forces that are downplaying national sovereignty and phasing out classical American concepts like the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence in favor of internationalist concepts. Who are these internationalist forces? The key leadership in the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderbergers, the American liberal internationalist establishment, McDonald told me, are Eastern and are promoting international sellout. The situation seems so bleak by McDonald's description that there appears little that could be done to remedy it, but to do away with parties altogether might be a step in the right direction. I'm totally at loss to the value of maintaining a political party. Neither stands for anything, he said. He is not encouraged by the emergence of articulate neoconservative Democrats like Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York, whom he considers a creature of the press, the most powerful branch of government. Even the conservative community is suspect, having been infiltrated, in his view, by imposters like journalist William F. Buckley Jr., who begins frothing at the mouth at any mention of conspiracy, and went out of his way to crush an ally, John Birch Society founder Robert Welch. MacDonald used to admire human events, but he believes that from 1965 on, the journal has facilitated and is no longer truly effective because it is careful never to mention the sinister forces promoting international sellout. He attributes this posture to the weekly's conservative editor, Thomas Winter, who knows it would be socially unacceptable to tell the truth about the conspiracy that is controlling American policy. Put it like this. National Review, Bill Buckley, to a degree the American Conservative Union and Battle Line are respectable conservatives. Translated, that means impotent, that they are no real threat. Liberals, he explained, are happy to have these respectable conservatives on hand because they represent no danger to their monopoly on power. They pretend to disdain groups like the John Birch Society solely because they are a threat. McDonald's Capitol Hill office is decorated with photographs of Joe McCarthy and General Pinochet, Chile's right-wing dictator, an appropriate base of operations from which to fill the congressional record with record-setting numbers of pages of statements and remarks, many of them dealing with international communism. He has endeared himself to the new right not only by virtue of his considerable disregard for the ridicule he receives from the Eastern press, but also by virtue of his solidly new right voting record and his willingness to introduce measures in 1978, calling for the impeachment of Andrew Young as the United Nations ambassador, and in 1979 demanding a sense of Congress that homosexuals will not receive protected status from the government. Larry MacDonald is an unreconstructed Georgia primitive with no interest in appearing to be anything else, and the new right loves him for it. The McLuhan era Matt Dillons. The enthusiasm of some new right leaders for Congressman Philip Crane and to a lesser extent for John Connolly suggests a new sophistication, a desire to be represented by political candidates who can be successfully packaged and marketed in a media age. Both are presentable, and both can make a striking impression on television. They are handsome men with an ability to communicate. Crane presents the right-wing platform in a manner that sounds moderate and plausible, sometimes deceptively so. A four-term Republican from the Chicago suburbs, he came to a sort of national attention when, in January 1979, he became the first declared candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. For a time, he seemed likely to become the new right's favorite candidate. He is a gregarious and articulate former professor of American history at Indiana University and Bradley University. In his case, intellectual achievement is acceptable because he is not an East Coast Ivy Leaguer. He is an enthusiastic campaigner who, over his eight years in Congress, has traveled tirelessly speaking before conservative and new right audiences and making numerous television appearances. From the beginning of his presidential campaign, he had the blessing of fundraiser Richard A. Viguri, who stood by his side when he announced his intention to seek the Republican nomination. 
For roughly 10 months, Figuri raised money for the Crane campaign. The forces motivating Crane to run were murky. He is ambitious and was angry at Reagan for choosing Schweiker as his running mate, an honor Crane himself expected, as noted in the preceding section. And he regarded Reagan as vulnerable because of his age. Thus did Crane refer to the necessity of physical strength in a chief executive, leading one conservative wag to suggest Arnold Schwarzenegger for president. The Crane campaign was low comedy from the start, though a profitable one for fundraising. There is a footnote here that says the following. In June of 78, this author was approached by the Crane Campaign Committee and asked to write a biography of Crane to be published by Green Hill Books of Ottawa, Illinois. I discussed the project with Crane himself at some length, but he turned down the offer after a representative of the candidate sent me a contract for the book. The Manchester Union leader publisher promptly fired off a scathing front page editorial, accusing Crane of an exercise in ego and vanity, and doing an about face. Publisher William Loeb, a Reagan supporter, said Crane had in 1979 told him Reagan was the one man in America capable of handling the problems facing this country. To divide the strength of the conservative element at this time, Loeb summed up, is nothing except insanity. Insanity or not, the campaign was off and running. Reagan aides said benignly that they would profit from having a candidate to the right of Reagan in the race. Crane took great umbrage at this. He was not, he insisted, to the right of Reagan. There were no differences at all between the two candidates. Why was he running then? Neither he nor his aides were ever able to answer. When I asked campaign manager Richard Williamson why Crane was in the race if he had no quarrel with Reagan, Williamson accused me of trying to pick a fight between the two Republicans. The Crane camp did pick up a number of former Reagan supporters, even key state organizers, impatient with Reagan's characteristic reluctance to get into the fray. Human events relentlessly probed the internal difficulties within the national headquarters, leading to a walkout of Crane's entire staff. Still more devastating, however, was a lengthy investigation by Loeb's union leader, which interviewed some 30 former aides and associates of Crane and charged that the candidate who offered to lead the right-wing crusade of moral righteousness was a hard-drinking gadabout who has told friends he wants to bed down 1,000 different women in his lifetime. His defenders responded that they had never seen him drunk or unruly. Through Vigiri's direct mail, Crane had raised $1.7 million by March 31st, 79. The campaign had spent $2 million and was $880,000 in debt, $461,000 to Vigiri and Crane, it was said by disgruntled new rightists, was not spending enough time talking about the social issues, and was emphasizing instead economic concerns of interest only to orthodox Republicans. Despite a photogenic face, Crane is bland and sometimes obtuse, preferring to lecture his audiences on economic policy in a somewhat pedantic manner. An ineffective legislator, he has a spotty attendance record, especially in House committee meetings, and is a remarkably poor administrator, plagued by staff turnover. Associates and former aides, many of whom approve of his solidly right-of-center voting record, describe him as a shallow and vain man more interested in the limelight than in serious political concerns, all of which accounts to some degree for the lack of seriousness with which his campaign was taken by his Republican opponents and eventually by the new right itself. Even early supporters like Figuri seem to have realized that, however acceptable his views, he is not the courageous, dedicated lawman they desire, and is at best a Hollywood imitation in a rhinestone-studded cowboy hat. The Crane campaign from here on out has nothing to do with political reality. One conservative fundraising specialist told me in May of 79, It must be viewed instead as a direct mail proposition only. That is, it will continue whether it is politically relevant or not. The only question is, how long will it remain profitable? It will continue to live, and Crane will continue to be a candidate as long as it makes money for Vigiri, and when it ceases, it will die. 
Vigiri raised money for Crane until his campaign qualified for $1 million in federal matching funds, and then the two parted company. The matching funds would be more than enough to cover the debt. One emerging Republican politician combined both a <clears throat> commanding media magnetism and an image of the tough sheriff was John Connolly, and the new rightists took note. As early as 1975, columnist Kevin Phillips called him the most charismatic and articulate of the new conservatives and the most competent, dynamic, and able political leader who might be in a position to go as a third-party candidate. Vigiri in 1975 called him a man on a white horse, a strong leader, a gladiator, and that's what the country needs. In 1979, when Reagan was leading all Republicans in public opinion polls seeking presidential preferences, William Rusher praised Connolly as a strong, energetic leader, and that may be what this country needs now to reassert its prestige in the world. Ordinarily, Rusher told me he does not as a matter of principle favor strong, energetic presidents. When Connolly declined the offer to enter the New Hampshire primary as a Republican, Vigiri, acting on a 1976 Supreme Court ruling allowing unlimited individual spending on behalf of a candidate, provided the money does not pass through the candidate's campaign treasury and there is no communication between the candidate's committee and the independent effort, spent between $35,000 and $50,000 of his own money to back Connolly as a write-in candidate on the Democratic line in the 1976 New Hampshire primary. According to an FEC report, Vigiri took out ads in 10 state newspapers with a total circulation of 202,000 and mailed almost 13,000 letters to right-wingers in the state. Warned by Human Events editor Tom Winter that the Connolly effort would draw votes away from Reagan, Vigiri dismissed the warning and went ahead with the project. The writing campaign gained little support, costing its sponsor about $1 a vote. And in 1979, when the presidential campaign of Crane began to founder, Vigiri took over Connolly's direct mail fundraising effort. New right disaffection with the Crane candidacy and the movement by Vigiri and others into the Connolly camp provoked a bemused response throughout conservative political circles. Since new right leaders like Wyrick implied that Crane, by playing down such volatile social issues as abortion, prayer in schools, and busing, was insufficiently conservative. There's certainly nothing like unanimity on the right when Vigiri and Connolly joined forces. Indeed, traditional conservatives and some new rightists had expressed deep disagreements with Connolly almost as soon as Vigiri, Phillips, and others began to speak highly of him. In almost every significant case, the conservatives pointed out, Connolly's positions are more liberal than Reagan's or, more recently, Crane's. Connolly, for example, refused to support a constitutional amendment prohibiting abortion. I just don't think we ought to legislate what ought to be done. He told Conservative Digest in 1975, and he supported certain forms of gun control, leading Citizens Committee spokesman John Snyder to tell me, Connolly's support of gun control legislation indicates to us that he is not in agreement with traditional American values, and is, in effect, one of many typical whores in the American political scene. Connolly indeed has denied that he is a conservative. It's hard for people to put me into a category, Connolly told the delegates to the 1977 Young Republican National Federation Convention. For sometimes I am a conservative, and on some issues I am a liberal. It is impossible to put me into a stratified position. I take the broad middle ground. He has supported the foreign policy of Henry Kissinger and detente. If by detente we mean the opening and continuity of conversation with the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union. And he has shown nothing but disgust at protests over Soviet grain sales. The idea that you get a bunch of longshoremen out there that are going to dictate the foreign policy of the country because they are not going to load ships is ridiculous on its face. This is a reference to sometime in the mid-70s when the USA agreed to sell a bunch of grain to the Soviet Union and various longshoremen went on strike to protest this sale, generally being anti-communist or anti-Soviet, and refused to load the ships. This is not a footnote officially in the book. I'm just listing this for 
any modern listeners who might not be aware what Connolly was referring to. Because of these and other positions, notably his defense of the Nixon administration's wage and price controls, Human Events was appropriately outraged at Vigiri's support for Connolly. Connolly, the Weekly noted, supported the creation of a costly consumer protection agency and liberalized abortion laws, anathema to most conservatives. Even the more conservative elements in the Ripon Society, a Republican policy group long associated with the Rockefeller wing of the party, were also opposed. What makes us moderates and progressives most uncomfortable about Connolly is very much like that which bothers human events and the conservatives. Ripon Society President John Topping told me. To the extent that we view ourselves as proponents of limited government, we fear Connolly as having too strong a preference for using state power. We sense that he is a statist, a man too far ready to use the power of the federal government, whether it is for conservative or liberal ends. Cited by both liberal and conservative critics is the Youth Service Project, a Connolly proposal of 1974 to make it mandatory for every young person who reaches the age of 18 to serve the government for one year. As Connolly explained in an interview with Lofton, the program would accomplish a number of objectives. First, you teach young people that they have an obligation to become interested in their government. Second, you provide a discipline for those young people, which we desperately need in this country. Third, it would reduce unemployment by creating public sector jobs. Young people would be compelled under Connolly's plan to work for local police departments, rebuild highway roadbeds, or clean up the highway since the young are the ones, by and large, who litter. A bonus, he told Lofton, is that forced association with government would familiarize young Americans with bureaucratic inefficiency, so they would never want the government to run anything. Conservative economist Milton Friedman, for one, was not impressed, calling the Connolly plan totalitarian and a warmed-over version of Adolf Hitler's youth movement. And columnist Nicholas von Hoffmann, a liberal deeply influenced by Friedman's economics, has dismissed the idea as an imbecilic bit of totalitarianism. Connolly advocated, before the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, no less, a version of the Townsend Plan, which he calls National Dividend Program, under which the federal government would split up all corporate tax money among the nation's voters, thus increasing the voter registration rules. Certainly, Connolly's past is well known to the new right, and there is little in it that suggests a genuine commitment to philosophical or political conservatism, nor to the routing of liberals. Brought into government by Lyndon Johnson, he served under Kennedy's New Frontier and Johnson's Great Society, and by 1972, a Republican, sold hated wage and price controls to the country as Treasury Secretary under Richard Nixon. Only on questions of foreign policy did Connolly seem to be in line with the New Right ideology, representing an aggressive, almost jingoistic interventionism. New Rightists, wary of Jimmy Carter's inability, they believe, to negotiate effectively with the Soviets over arms limitations, saw Connolly, a self-described horse trader, as a shrewd wheeler dealer up to the task of dealing with the crafty commies. But his association with the new wealth of the Sun Belt, as opposed to the settled wealth of the e of the Effet East, was suspect. Between July and September of '79, Connolly received campaign contributions from David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and his brother Lawrence, Andrew Heiskell of Time Incorporated, and other bastions of big business. By the fall of '79, there were indications that some new rightists were not prepared to back Connolly as Vigiri was. At a meeting with right-wing leaders in Washington, Connolly by no means won over all of the participants. One new right leader quoted by columnists Roland Evans and Robert Novak reported afterwards what Connolly was LBJ with charisma. To the extent that he continued to command some allegiance from them, it was because, through, though slicker than George Wallace, he represented a similar political style. Appearing on the cover of Conservative Digest as the Texas cattle rancher in his cowboy garb, Connolly represented the familiar sheriff from the Old West in whose animosity to citified ways the new right saw hope that he would shoot it out with the city slickers of the eastern seaboard, or as the riverboat gambler, take their money in a poker game. Like Wallace, he seemed out of sorts with the social and cultural, if not economic, policies of the McGovern liberals, deep down and despite his flaws, Connolly, too, is one of 
Pass. In March 1980, after suffering a series of primary defeats at the hands of Reagan, Connolly dropped out of the presidential race. List left many new rightists once again disappointed and presented the possibility that, lacking any other alternative, they would close ranks, however reluctantly, behind their one-time hero, Ronald Reagan. The likelihood was increased, certainly, when Reagan dropped as campaign manager their Petit Noir John Sears. As the American historian Richard Hofstetter has written, the ideologues, as opposed to the opportunists of the American right, suffer not so much from the policies of this or that administration, but from a deep-seated disgust of all constituted authority, entertaining expectations that cannot be realized, being uncomfortable with the thought of any leadership that falls short of perfect. The extreme right is also incapable of analyzing the world with enough common sense to establish any adequate and realistic criterion for leadership. One of the fundamental qualities, then, of the right-wing mentality of our time is its implicit utopianism. I can think of no more economical way of expressing its fundamental difference from the spirit of genuine conservatism. After searching for leaders who will not disappoint them, they are constantly betrayed by those who engage in the practical necessities of electoral politics. Tolerating no compromise, accepting no half measures, and understanding no defeats, they stand outside the mainstream of normal democratic politics. Utopians to the bitter end, the last major office holder in this country whom the new right claims to be one of their own was Spiro Agnew, who was allowed by Richard Nixon to make right-wing speeches. And even Agnew was never really one of them at all. It remains one of the great secrets of conservative trivia that, in 1966, an American conservative union survey of the 50 governors ranked Agnew among the most liberal, cheek by jowl with Romney and Rockefeller. Only after Baltimore County riots in 1970 did the right take Agnew to its heart. Only, that is, after he talked back to black leaders, and in 1969, the Efete Press thus manifesting signs of adversarianism, of being against, of right-wing social protest.